Chapter 24, Quiet. Jackson Tate has overcome his fear of Freya. He realizes she only wants the best for Apollo, and this is something he can most certainly deliver. Jackson shows him around his Calistoga townhouse. Like his office, it is adorned with music paraphernalia, gold records, and signed guitars. He rationalizes that Apollo should be more impressed. We're talking Eddie Van Halen, Jimmy Page, and Jeff Beck. Apollo glosses over them as if he'd never heard of them. He looks at pictures of bands, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, and Metallica, to name a few. Again, Apollo is unimpressed. Don't you like what you see? Jackson finally asks. They look like minstrels, Apollo answers. Minstrels? Jackson laughs. These are some of the greatest musicians of the last five decades. Five decades isn't a very long time. While I like where you're going with this, you must respect the past. I heard you play Hendrix. Until you have your own mixes, honor those who came before you. Why? I can play much better than what I heard in your automobile. Give me a chance to create my own songs. Jackson is stunned. Those guitars were the best in history. Well, you're in luck, Apollo. I have a soundproof room. Knock yourself out. But don't learn their songs. I don't represent cover bands. Apollo has no idea what a cover band is. Instead, he follows Jackson into a room where guitars are lined up against the wall. Microphones are ready. Bass guitars occupy a smaller portion of the room, and two full drum sets lie in the corner. You think you can do something with this? Be my guest. Apollo soaks in the room. There are instruments he's never seen. He makes a beeline toward the bass and thumps it. Little noise comes out. Jackson is sarcastic. Let me plug you in. Apollo enjoys the bass. He heard Deep Purple during the ride. He strums Smoke on the Water to perfection. No covers, Jackson reminds. Make your own music, Apollo nods. Jackson shuts the door. With Apollo safely behind the doors, Jackson must face Freya and her gun. Certainly we're past this, he explains. I mean no harm to you or to Apollo. Apollo may well be the next big rock star if you'll just let him. Is currency possible? I have a feeling we may need it. I don't ordinarily front money, but we'll see what Apollo comes up with. I could put him on the local circuit soon, and then, who knows? I'm not sure that's going to be such a good idea. Jackson rolls his eyes. You're a tough sell, aren't you? A solid knock bangs on Jackson's door. Expecting anyone? He asks Freya. Freya shakes her head. Cautiously, Jackson peers through the peephole. He doesn't immediately recognize the scruffy Native American on the other side of the door. Who are you? He says, attempting to sound aggressive. Coyote takes a crowbar and busts through the door. Freya is up in a flash. She points her gun and fires. Click. Freya is out of ammo. She pulls the trigger several more times, but the result is the same. Nothing. Nothing at all. Coyote cannot help but laugh at Freya's predicament. You're out of bullets, sweet cheeks. And I'm fully loaded. Jackson feels a wave of anger wash over him, but it's mostly directed at himself. He's been held hostage by a hot chick with an empty gun. Still, he was able to spend time with Apollo, the most promising musician he'd seen in his 30-year career. Coyote instructs Freya and Jackson to sit on the sofa. Where's Apollo? He demands. Jackson answers quickly. He's not here. We left him behind. I thought I'd get to know his girlfriend a little better. You know something, Jackson Tate? I don't know whether to be furious or honored that you'd choose to lie to me. I mean, I don't even play an instrument, unless you count an elkskin drum. Now, I'm not naive enough to believe that you only lie to clients, but still. Quote turns his attention to Freya. Now you, you were a particularly good shot. Drop that behemoth dead right there in the street. I can't say I was surprised that you tried to kill me on sight. But I am disappointed that you do not even know how to use the weapon. You are out of bullets, or if I may translate, arrows. Well, I'd have to say you're extremely lucky, Freya responds. Coyote snickers. Always am. But you, not so much. He raises the gun and aims it between Freya's eyes. Naturally, she refuses to sit still. Coyote fires and misses. He is on her like a flash. The gun pointed to her head. If you have any last words, now would be an excellent time to say them. Freya struggles and looks to Jackson, but he is parked on the sofa, trembling in fear. 
Freya closes her eyes and accepts her fate. Womp! Diana cold cocks Coyote. He drops the gun and falls unconscious. Freya scoops up the gun, but Diana insists she hand it over to her. Freya, what brings you to Earth? I'm on a rescue mission. You, I heard, were banished. Jackson cannot believe his ears. Earth? Just where are you ladies from? Diana answers, Greece. Freya responds with, Folkvangen. Jackson stares blankly. You know it is Norway. Hand me your phone. You've both had an intruder and an attempted murder here tonight. I need to call this in to Napa's finest. Freya doesn't understand the ramifications of this, but Jackson certainly does. Reluctantly, he hands Diana the phone. Diana dials 911. She identifies herself as an SFPD officer and describes the situation to the dispatcher. A black and white will be along momentarily, she is assured. Seconds after she hangs up the phone, Apollo emerges from the soundproof room. Now that was fun, he announces to Jackson. Apollo assesses the room. Coyote is lying unconscious. Freya and Jackson sit on the couch, and his twin sister is holding a weapon like Freya had. Apollo! Diana exclaims. What are you doing here? Artemis, I might ask you the same question. It is so good to see you. Apollo looks at Coyote, laid out on the floor. I assume this was your handiwork? It was. Oh, and as long as I'm earthbound, I go by Diana. It's less godlike. Apollo laughs. That's really quite amusing. I'm sure your Roman counterpart would not approve. Diana has learned a few choice words from working in the department. Fuck her. What's she ever done for me? I've been learning to play music. That's Jackson. He's going to make me a star. Diana surveys the room. We need to leave. Now. Napa's police will be here any second. I don't want to explain what happened here. Freya and Jackson leap off the couch. They are more than ready to go. Freya, because she doesn't know what's going on. But if Diana doesn't like it, she doesn't want any part of it. Jackson would like to leave because he has about a pound of marijuana and half kilo of coke stashed in his bedroom. They are prepared to flee, but Apollo points to Coyote. What about him? Damn, the loose ends, Diana mutters. Okay, Freya and Apollo pick him up. There's a dumpster outside with his name on it. Coyote awakens in a waste management green industrial-sized garbage retrieval unit. It's not the first time he's been dropped in a dumpster, but this is certainly the most inconvenient time. There's a ruckus outside, and he peers over the walls. Three police cars are surrounding Jackson's mansion. Coyote weighs his options. He was certainly crafty enough to make an escape, or he could hide and hope for the best. He ponders this and remembers his motorcycle. Any policeman worth his badge would find it. The cops are focused on the house. They are likely destroying it in a desperate attempt to find some sort of evidence. Coyote touches the back of his throbbing head. There is a little blood, but it will be hard to match it to him. It could have been anyone. Plus, he doesn't have an identifiable blood type or any fingerprints. Good luck catching him. Silently, Coyote scales the walls of the garbage cube. He sits atop the side briefly to orient himself with the landscape. The police have attracted quite the crowd. The residents were up in arms. They heard the gunshots. Have you made an arrest? They ask. Do you know if anyone was murdered? Satisfied that the cops are busy, Coyote slinks through the shadows until he reaches the security gate. Here, things would be more complicated. The guards are itching to be involved in any potential arrest. Some are dropouts at the academy. Some are looking to move out of security detail and onto the force. There are three of them. Coyote needs to get past them with as little drama as possible. The guards are positioned in the worst possible way. One watches the entrance, another the exit. The third is of most concern. He walks the perimeter carrying a flashlight, a walkie-talkie, and a firearm by his side. Despite the inherent danger associated with this third guard, he is the one Coyote needs to surpass. Coyote searches himself for potential weapons, but there is nothing to be found. He knows that, on this occasion, he will not be able to simply talk his way by. And as much as he eschews physical contact, there is really no other way. He waits patiently behind a bush, watching the man's every move. The guard stops in a corner and sets the flashlight and walkie-talkie down to take a piss on the wall. It's now or never. Coyote maneuvers without a sound, with one eye on the security at the entrance and the other on his intended target. Coyote successfully sneaks past the security gate. 
Cautiously, he approaches the guard from behind and retrieves the flashlight. The guard turns around abruptly, urinating on Coyote in the process, but this is a small price for freedom. Coyote repeatedly hits the guard in the head with the battery side of the flashlight, knocking him out. He seizes the gun. Never know when one might come in handy. The guards at the security gate see the flashlight being shined from multiple directions. Everything all right over there, Mike? Coyote knows he has but seconds to react. His motorcycle is at least 100 yards away, so he sprints. As he runs, he can hear the walkie-talkie growing more and more concerned. Soon, the other guards would come to the aid of their fallen comrade, but he'll be long gone before they put things together. Coyote rolls his bike from behind the bushes and revs it up. It is a particularly noisy motorcycle. This is one of the things he loved about it, but tonight, it is a hindrance. There would be cops on his tail before he knew it, so he opted to retreat, to a place he'd swore he'd never go to again, the reservation. Diana answers the unasked question. We're going back to San Francisco. Diana is driving fast. Apollo is in the front seat, but Freya and Jackson are in the back, behind the wire and metal screen. Freya could be happier about the seating arrangement. Diana, why exactly am I in a cage? Diana sighs. Two reasons. You have to sit somewhere. Understood. But why here? Because you're also my prime person of interest in Pluto's murder. Freya barks. Need I remind you I'm not a person but a goddess? But I am certainly of interest. Jackson shudders. He knew Freya had a screw loose, but didn't think she was a murderer. Freya is incensed. Murder? I saved Apollo from that monster. Apollo, do you think you could explain that to your sister? It's true, Apollo says. Pluto is sent to Earth specifically to kill me. Freya arrived just before he could accomplish his mission. Jackson speaks up. So that's why you were so beat up when you came to my office. Freya snaps with sarcasm dripping. I believe the Oracle of Delphi has just made an appearance. Diana interrupts. In any event, Freya, you shot and killed a god. My job on Earth is to bring you to justice. Justice was served with Pluto's death. Now the question remains, what do you suppose will happen to me? Diana is quiet. Honestly, I'm not sure, she finally admits. We need to get you a lawyer. If we can prove that you acted in defense on Apollo's behalf, you should be fine. Should be, Freya repeats. You do realize there are forces at work here beyond your comprehension. I'm beginning to suspect that. However, I have sworn an oath to protect and serve the community. That includes Apollo, but not you. At the moment, you are considered a danger to society. Jackson intercedes. What about me? I know a little something about the law. This will be construed as kidnapping. I think you are a material witness. Plus, you jumped at the chance to get out of that house of yours. If I didn't know better, I'd assume you have something to hide. Jackson shuts up for now, but Freya is still on fire. She leans back and kicks the wire separating the back seat from the front. She kicks with all her might, but the screen does not budge. Diana advises, Save your strength, Freya. Many people stronger than you have tried that. It never works. It does make quite the noise, Apollo observes. I promise to let you out in an hour or so, Diana says. But let it be known that you will be locked up in a prison until this is worked out. Freya continues kicking until she tires herself out. Diana smiles. Freya would be a patient rider until they arrive in San Francisco.